Uh, today we're going to talk about communicating complex statistics. So I often like to think about uh, statistical communications on this grid uh, where on the x-axis we're measuring how true it is and so kind of how factual uh, the analysis presented is. And so over here we've got true and over here we have not true. So we've sort of classified uh, we've classified analyses as true or not true, and we're going to get in a, a little more deeply into what we actually mean by true or not true. And then on the y-axis, I have how interesting an analysis is. Uh, and so on the top, uh, we have statistical analyses that are deemed interesting based on how they're communicated. And on the bottom, not interesting. So down here in this lower left quadrant, we have not interesting and not true analyses. And this is typically not really uh, a problem in the sense that if you do an analysis that isn't correct, uh, but it's not terribly interesting, it probably isn't going to get much traction and therefore won't cause much damage. So in the, in the sense of uh, global damage that you could potentially do with statistics, this is not really a problem. And I think uh, this framework, you know, just to kind of give some uh, credence to why this is, I think, really important to think about is that, you know, if, you, if we look at how our world works, um, statistics play a really key role in trying to understand uh, and make decisions about a whole wide variety of things from policy to health decisions, um, et cetera. And so making sure that those statistics that are being used to inform these different things um, are correct and, and also that they're getting into the hands of the right people, uh, which sort of falls under this interesting role, is, is actually a really big priority. Okay, so we're not so worried about this quadrant here. I'm going to not focus on it for the rest of, uh, of, this, um, of this lecture. And then we have this not interesting and true. We've got not true and, uh, but interesting. And this is the like alarm zone because this is where um, you know, statistical uh, concepts are communicated uh, and they're compelling. And so people are really interested in the results. But it turns out there's something not true about what's being communicated. And that's where things can really go awry, especially when we're talking about things like policy and healthcare and kind of how people are making personal decisions and things like that. And then, of course, we've got the target, which is uh, an analysis that is both true and interesting. OK, so this is the framework that I, I've sort of put together for how to think about communicating statistics. And so let's first talk about moving an analysis from not true to true. And so for this, I'm going to use an example uh, that, that is quite recent. Um, there was a paper that was trying to estimate COVID-19 mortality for patients on a mechanical ventilator. And so the endpoint here, uh, they were looking at basically whether or not uh, somebody, whether or not patients died that were put on this ventilator. Uh, but in this original paper, which was published in JAMA, uh, which is a, a very uh, high-profile medical journal, it had a line in it that said mortality for those requiring mechanical ventilation was 88.1%. So that sounds really alarming. 88% uh, of, of people who were on a ventilator uh, were dying. But it turns out that that was incorrect. Uh, there was a correction that was issued a couple days later uh, that, that actually did the statistical analysis correctly. Uh, so that, that estimate 88% was based on a flawed statistical analysis. And the right one uh, stated as of April 4th, 2020, for patients requiring mechanical ventilation, which consisted of 1,151 patients, or 20.2% of the sample, 38 were discharged alive, so 3.3%. 282 died, so 24.5%, and 831 remained in the hospital, so 72.2%. So this was a much more accurate representation of, uh, of, the, of the data. And if you notice here, the majority of patients were in this, uh, this remained in the hospital bin, so people that were still hospitalized. And the way they had made the statistical mistake originally is they had just removed those people from the calculation. So they looked at uh, these, they took these 38 people that were discharged alive and they added that to the 282 that died and they treated that as the denominator. And then they took 282 divided by 282 plus 38. And so that excluded the majority of patients, 800 and 
31 that we actually don't know if they're going to die or uh, be discharged. And there's a good chance that several of those will end up being discharged and that number would change um, from 88% to something much lower, which is uh, basically what was seen in the end. So this is uh, kind of the first uh, step to being to having an analysis be true. The first thing that's important is that it is mathematically correct. And so uh, what we mean by that is that there hasn't been some kind of math error like in this paper where they had used the wrong denominator uh, to, to uh, assess the, the number. Here's another uh, example. Uh, this was a tutorial to help people recognize bad science in the news. And so this was actually one that I worked on uh, in my postdoc with Jeff Leake. We put together this uh, TED-Ed um, uh, lecture that you can, it's a little TED-Ed cartoon that you can watch. We had two of them that we basically were trying to communicate uh, how you can recognize bad science in the news. And so this is uh, the this is how this ended up getting promoted. Uh, if you go to YouTube to find our our TED Ed um, cartoon, that you'll be faced with this clickbait, clickbait, clickbait image, uh, and then it we the title says this one weird trick will help you spot clickbait. So that's what they titled our our piece. Uh, we were not in charge of the marketing of this piece. Uh, we just. Uh, contributed the content, so the title as well as uh, this this initial image were a little bit outside of our control in that sense, and it was kind of a a bit of a frustrating moment for me because we had put together this um, piece that was trying to sort of walk through different ways to recognize bad headlines or misleading headlines, and then in a twist of irony, the headline we were given for our tutorial was um, a little bit misleading and. Clickbaity, uh, and uh, and so this was the problem. And the issue here that I want to highlight is that it, it's not necessarily that it was they made this an interesting title that people would want to click on because of course we want to be in that interesting quadrant. We want people to watch our things, uh, but we want to make sure that we're kind of giving people the right impression of of what they're going to be reading. And we also want to make sure that we. Um, especially in headlines, and of course this is covered in, in this if you actually do end up clicking on it, but the uh, in, in a lot of folks don't read past the headlines, and so the importance of kind of including all the pertinent information in that headline in order to make sure that not only are we gaining trust, but we're also communicating what, uh, what the object or whatever it is, whether it's a video or article or newspaper, um, clipping that it's correct. And so my main problem with this was that, you know, this was, there's not just one way to help you spot clickbait. Um, in fact, we highlight several different things that are important to think of. And so the title saying this one weird trick will help you spot clickbait is a particularly misleading one because there really isn't just one way to do it. There's several different uh, tools that you need in your tool belt to be able to do that correctly. And so what that gets to is uh, that, you know, not only everything that was in, included in that tutorial that we put together was mathematically correct, you know, we, we, we explained everything from a statistically sound standpoint, um, but the next piece that's important if something is going to be deemed true in terms of a statistical communication is that it needs to be marketed correctly. And I show that example because, you know, this is something I'm really passionate about and I myself have had pieces of my statistical content be uh, marketed incorrectly. And so sort of uh, keeping in mind that that's a really important thing to to uh, to be able to get a hold of when you're trying to communicate something uh, via statistics. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, estimating COVID-19 mortality for patients on the mechanical ventilator. So going back to that one that we had talked about previously, where in JAMA, this uh, very prestigious medical journal, they had this line that had a statistical mistake in it, where they um, stated that the mortality was 88.1% uh, was uh, due to having the wrong denominator. And so if we go to that example, if we look at, there's a, we can look at the, how widespread that uh, that paper was disseminated. And this was pulled very early on. This was pulled very close to when this paper uh, came out initially. A and that that figure, 88%, made lots and lots of headlines at the time. Uh, in fact, this paper was mentioned in 301 news outlets. It was tweeted at the time 8,000, over 8,000, almost 9,000 times. I, I think it, it probably is much higher than that now. Uh, and, and, and so forth. So there's a lot of kind of 
dissemination of this incorrect information. And meanwhile, the correction, which came out just a couple days later, uh, was was actually very rarely uh, disseminated. And so at the time, there were only about 13 news outlets that had that had uh, picked this up and about 600 um, tweets about it. And so it's just much, much less uh, commonly disseminated. So even though the authors did the right thing, they got the math correct, uh, and they even are marketing it correctly now that they have this uh, the right uh, pieces here, it, it's not getting disseminated correctly in that the marketing that was done previously on the incorrect uh, statistical analysis is not really getting corrected. Nobody um, in these news outlets or many people in these news outlets are not going back and actually correcting the record, removing that 88% from their headlines uh, to base it on the actual right one. And so that comes to the next uh, piece for when we're on this journey to truth. Uh, it needs to be mathematically correct, marketed correctly, and disseminated correctly. And then one more example. So this was examining COVID-19 cases per 100,000 people in Georgia by county. And I love this example because I think that uh, it's very interesting to see kind of the uh, disparity between how data analysts, so kind of what data analysts think people are going to do with their analyses and what people actually end up doing. And so here, uh, this made a little bit of a splash on Twitter. Someone noticed that um, in just 15 days, the total number of COVID-19 cases in Georgia is up 49%, but you wouldn't know it from looking at the state's data visualization map of cases. The first map is July 2nd. The second is today. Do you see a 50% increase? Can you spot how they're hiding it? So the implication here is that uh, that the Georgia data visualization people are intentionally hiding the uh, increase in cases. But in fact, what's being shown here are two plots that are never shown side by side in this visualization. The way that these plots were pulled is that somebody accessed the dashboard on July 2nd and took a screenshot of this plot. And then they accessed the dashboard on July 17th, and they took a screenshot of this plot, and then they put them side by side. And these plots, what they actually are, this, this is uh, intended to show the relative uh, relationship between uh, cases per 100,000 and counties to be able to basically demonstrate which counties are the worst off at any given time. And so the coloring is done by uh, quantiles. And this is actually a very common way to color a map. Um, and so you'll notice that these bins in these different quantiles are different for the different time periods. And that's because the number of cases has changed. And so when you calculate quantiles, uh, if you calculate, you know, for example, this is quintiles. So you've got one, two, three, four, five categories here. If you split the data into five equal sets and you have different numbers, uh, you're going to end up with different kind of bins for each of those. And so when this first one was created on July 2nd, the maximum uh, number of, of cases per 100,000 was 4,661. And when it was updated on uh, on uh July 17th, the maximum now was 5,165. And so they, since those were different, basically all of these bins end up changing. So the pictures don't look too different uh, because the colors correspond to essentially which counties have fewer cases relative to other counties in Georgia. Um, this is not meant to tell you kind of what the cases, case rates are looking at over time. These maps are not meant to be looked at over time. So when I first saw this, I was thinking, oh, these poor data visualization people, They're, people are not interpreting their plots the way they ought to be interpreted. And then I went and looked at it, and I saw here it says, uh, if you look at it on mobile, it says the charts here are meant to be reported over time. But if you look at it on, uh, on a desktop, it actually is a little bit clearer. So it says, the top says, the, the so here says the charts below, are supposed to be looked at over time. But if you look on mobile, the map ends up being on top, and this plot over time ends up being on the bottom. When you look on desktop, it's much clearer. It You can see it says the map represents uh, the number of COVID-19 cases per county, and the chart below represents the new confirmed cases over time. And these are two different plots. So the, the map is not meant to be looked at over time. The chart here on the right is. 
But on mobile, that wasn't super obvious. That was more obvious on a desktop application. And many people were looking at these applications on their mobile devices. And the other thing that made this uh, particularly unclear is that not only were people looking at these on their mobile devices, so they were maybe confusing the, the captions, uh, but also people were doing what, what that individual who tweeted it uh, was doing quite often, where they were screenshotting uh, the output every day and then looking at it side by side, which is not often how you, as a statistical analyst, that wouldn't necessarily be how I would expect people to consume statistics on a dashboard. I would think that they would just look at it on the given day and kind of move on. But there's been a lot of kind of distrust in people kind of wanting to make sure that they have access to the data at all times. And so people have been tracking it themselves over time. And knowing that audiences are doing that is a really important extra piece. And so what am I saying in all of this? Well, my big point here is the question of, was this incorrect to have these uh, these plots that, that people are interpreting incorrectly? And I would argue that, yes, because people, the audience, the way the audience interprets it is really important uh, for how you're actually communicating something and whether or not it's communicated effectively. And so while the mathematics behind both of these plots was correct, they, they calculated the quintiles correctly, and uh, it, it was technically marketed correctly, uh, even though on mobile it was a little confusing, but on the desktop you can see that uh, it, it does specify that these plots are not meant to be looked at over time. The one that is supposed to be looked at over time is the line chart that's later shown. It's even disseminated correctly, uh, but the audience is interpreting it incorrectly. And so that's a very important piece here in this journey to truth is that not only does it need to be mathematically correct, marketed correctly, disseminated correctly, but the audience needs to interpret it correctly. And if an audience isn't interpreting it correctly, then maybe you need to either have a different visualization uh, or a more explicit explanation of why that might be incorrect. And so this uh, kind of journey to true involves these four components. Okay, so we've talked about how to get from not true to true for a statistical analysis. So now let's talk about how to get from not interesting to interesting. So here's an example. A collaborator is trying to decide how to analyze observational data. And I hand them my dissertation. So my uh, dissertation for my PhD was on different methods for uh, observational data, particularly for how to weight uh, data so that you can try to get uh, an estimate an appropriate estimate. So I said, check out my dissertation. And this was uh, true. The, the components of my, the math my, in my dissertation is correct. It's marketed correctly. It's disseminated correctly. Uh, depending on kind of how I package it, I would argue the audience, at least my audience on my dissertation committee, could understand it. Uh, but it was not particularly interesting, especially to this particular person that was uh, asking me, uh, this collaborator that was interested in, obser in uh, observational data and how to analyze it best. And so let's talk about how to move from uh, something that is not interesting to interesting. Uh, so I ended up packaging my dissertation into a short blog post that talked specifically about something called propensity score weighting. Uh, this involved some visuals to show kind of different weights that you could implement and basically was a condensed version of a focused part of my dissertation uh, that that addressed the, the particular question that this collaborator had about how to analyze observational data. It had pictures. Uh, it didn't kind of overdo the mathematics, but it showed the pieces that were important. And it, uh, importantly, was, was really focused on just the, the piece that was of interest to this particular audience member. And so instead of saying, oh my goodness, check out my dissertation, I could now say, hey, check out this blog post, which sounds a little bit more interesting to the average consumer. And so the journey to interesting uh, has a lot of steps. The first being that the medium is, is appropriate. And so, for example, in the one example I just gave, going from a long PDF to a short blog post. The next is the length. And so only including the important stuff, uh, only including kind of what is, what is necessary instead of handing people a huge report with a ton of uh, information that's hard to, to, con to kind of consume, uh, only including what is absolutely necessary to get the point across. And then the next piece to consider is the complexity. So only include the necessary equations, ditch the jargon, things like that. Uh, then focus is next, pick a single message. So for example, in that case, uh, they were interested particularly in an analysis method known as propensity score weighting. And so I kind of focused on just that instead of giving uh, a whole bunch of background and things. 
visuals. So humans like pictures, including plots and things as much as possible is always really recommended. And then finally, marketing. Make sure that you promote it in a way uh, that is appropriate, but also to, to make sure it, it actually gets the traction that it needs. So putting this together with true and interesting, so for things to be, uh, for an analysis to be considered true, it needs to be mathematically correct, marketed correctly, disseminated correctly, and the audience needs to interpret it correctly. And so putting this all together, basically we need to have the appropriate medium, length, complexity, and focus. It needs to be mathematically correct. You should include some visuals. It should be marketed correctly, disseminated correctly, and the audience should interpret it correctly. And so kind of to summarize this, you want to first consider the audience. So who's going to be consuming this statistical analysis that you're creating? And this would be sort of what will help you determine the correct medium, length, complexity, focus, and whether or not they're going to interpret it correctly. So for example, if my audience was my dissertation committee, handing them my dissertation would be correct. That is the right medium, length, complexity, and focus. And I can trust that they're going to interpret it correctly, or hopefully if I've done it correctly, they will. The next is to consider the content, uh, whether it's mathematically correct and making sure that if you can include visuals, it's always good to, to do that. And then finally, consider the marketing. Make sure it's being marketed and disseminated correctly. So there you have it, a journey from interesting to true and true, a journey to interesting and true, rather, uh, for communicating complex statistics. Thank you.